In 1985, astronaut Buzz Aldrin proposed a spacecraft called a Mars Cycler, often called an Aldrin Cycler, that would help shuttle people and supplies between Earth and a future Mars colony. This is the orbit that a simple cycler like Aldrin's would follow. If you're familiar with orbital mechanics, this isn't anything remarkable in terms of efficiency, but that's not what it's for. The idea is to have a moving depot for fuel, supplies, and living space for crews on a months-long interplanetary voyage which doesn't need fuel for itself, but instead can keep up with both planets via gravity assists. Because it doesn't need fuel, it can be a lot bigger than the tiny capsules in the usual plans for Mars missions. Now, admittedly, this is a simplified diagram. This assumes that all of the planet's orbits are circular and coplanar, and that Mars's orbit is exactly 1 and 7 eighths Earth years. In reality, the planet's orbits look more like this, and in particular Mars's orbit is 9% eccentric. But that 9% means that we can consider the results here to be within the margin of variation. If we choose the right orbital alignment, we can get the same numbers for the real planets. Here's how it works. Earth and Mars line up in their orbits every 26 months, which is also why we need to launch spacecraft to Mars every 26 months. We have to wait for it to be in the right position. It starts with a simple trajectory from Earth to Mars, and note how it cuts inside Earth's orbit to initially get to Mars. Five months later, it passes Mars, and the passengers can get off on a smaller taxi ship. It then takes the next 19 or so months to loop around past Mars and back again to where it started at Earth's orbit. The Aldrin Cycler is a large spaceship, really a space station, that orbits the Sun on an eccentric orbit that crosses the orbits of both Earth and Mars, but not once every 26 months. That's an oversimplification that you sometimes see, but it's more like 24 and a half. Of course, when it gets there, Earth isn't there anymore because it's been slightly more than two years, so Earth is a little bit ahead around its orbit. But that's okay because the cycler is now cutting closer to the Sun again, where it speeds up and can catch back up to Earth a few weeks later. This is where the 26 months comes in. The cycler catches up with Earth after a total of two and one-seventh years, when Earth and Mars are in the same orbital alignment as when it started. Of course, now the ship is not on the right trajectory to reach Mars again. It's on an outbound path from the Sun when it needs to be on an inbound path, like we started with. But that's okay too, because all you need to do is have the cycler do a gravity assist maneuver around Earth to rotate its orbit and point it at Mars again, and the cycle is complete. This is a really cool idea, but there's one drawback. The gravity assist doesn't work, at least not on its own. It can't rotate the orbit far enough to reach Mars again. If you do the math, the distance it has to pass from Earth is below Earth's surface. Instead, you need to do an engine burn to do a powered gravity assist to get it all the way there. Luckily, there's a solution to this, too. After Aldrin, other people studied the problem and found more complicated orbits, which require multiple cycles of 26 months to complete, but which don't require any engine burns, what are called ballistic cyclers. Ballistic doesn't just mean missiles. It can mean any spacecraft that maneuvers under gravity alone. This is the simplest ballistic cycler, which was found by engineers at Purdue University and is called S1L1 because it has one short orbit and one long orbit. This cycle takes 52 months to complete. The cycler starts close to the same way, taking about five months on its long orbit to reach Mars. 
although note that it starts on an outbound trajectory from the Sun this time. This long orbit has a period of just under 18 months, meaning it should meet up with Earth again after two orbits, or three years. But because its orbit is a little bit shorter, Earth catches up with it two months early, when it's on its inbound trajectory. The cycler then does an unpowered gravity assist around Earth, one that doesn't need an engine burn, to move onto its short orbit. The short orbit has a period of only 13 months, and the cycler spends about one and a half years in this orbit before it meets up with Earth again. Now it's been a total of four and two sevenths years, or a bit under 52 months. And Earth and Mars are back in the correct orbital alignment to start over. If you rotate the orbits around the correct axis, you'll see that the cycler is in a mirror image of the previous gravity assist configuration. So all it needs to do is a gravity assist in the reverse direction to get back onto a rotated version of its long orbit, which points back at Mars, and the cycle is complete once again. Again, this is a really cool idea, but it could be better. The one big limitation of a Mars cycler, Aldrin or otherwise, is that you have to build it in the first place, and haul all that mass up from Earth to begin with. That's expensive. So I went looking for a different solution. I cross-referenced the S1-L1 Mars Cycler with the orbits of known asteroids. It actually narrows down pretty quickly. You need an asteroid that matches either the long orbit or the short orbit. With as low an inclination as possible, and big enough to provide raw materials to build a ship. Near-Earth asteroids are rare enough that it's not guaranteed that you'd find one that works. But as it happens, there is one that's surprisingly close. And it's one that the space community is already familiar with. This is 25143 Itokawa. It was visited in 2005 by the Japanese Hayabusa spacecraft, and was the first asteroid to have a sample brought back to Earth. It's half a kilometer long, it weighs approximately 35 million tons, and it happens to have very close to the same orbit as the long orbit of the Mars Cycler. That was valuable for Hayabusa because that orbit gives it relatively low delta V to get there from Earth. And it's valuable for the Mars Cycler because it's a lot of mass that's already pretty close to where we need it. How close? Well, that's where it gets tricky. The numbers I listed before aren't exact because we assumed circular orbits. But like I said, the true answer is probably within the margin of variation, so we can keep using those numbers to get a rough estimate. And if you know the Vis Viva equation, and or have played Kerbal Space Program, you can probably work it out. First, you need to raise Itokawa's perihelion when it's at aphelion. That requires a delta V, a net change in velocity, of about 100 meters per second. Then, you need to lower the aphelion when it's at perihelion. That's another 200 meters per second. As for the inclination, the mutual inclination between Itokawa and Mars is actually very low, but the main limitation is lining up the first gravity assist at Earth. That will depend on the configuration of the orbits, but it should be within this range. All told, the delta V from Itokawa to where the Mars cycler needs to be is probably between half a kilometer and one kilometer per second. And that's not a lot on an interplanetary mission. Now, it would be great if we could move the entire asteroid there. But even if we can't, 
we could still mine it for materials dirt cheap. Itokawa has iron and aluminum that could be used as building materials. It of course has raw stone that can be used for radiation and micrometeoroid shielding. And it has water. Not a lot of water, less than 0.1% by mass, but water. It may sound extravagant to squeeze water from rocks like that. But keep in mind, past escape velocity, anything that you don't have to lift from Earth is literally worth its weight in gold. As in, if there were gold bars stacked up on the moon, it would not be worth the expense to fly up there and bring them back to Earth. That's how much it's worth. When you're in interplanetary space, living off the immaterial land, you have to use every part of the asteroid. And Itokawa is one that's perfectly placed for the taking. <laughs>